Meg stared at the sky in horrible fascination. Suddenly she remembered something her father had said to her mother one night while Meg was clearing the dinner dishes. I have a hunch that there's some connection between your discoveries about the effect of herandoli on mitochondria and that unexplained phenomenon out in space. Yes, that sound. It's the same, isn't it? The strange cry of the ailing mitochondria and the cosmic scream picked up in those distant galaxies by the sonar instruments. Oh, there's a horrid similarity between them. Most of that conversation, Megling, you didn't hear with your conscious mind, you know. But how did you hear me remembering, Progo? You're beginning to learn how to kive, to talk without words. For a human creature, you show a distinct talent for kithing. Is it like mental telepathy? Um, you might say that mental telepathy is the very beginning of learning to kive. Meg looked back at the sky. The line of nothingness was still there. She wondered what this distant phenomenon could have to do with Charles Wallace's pallor, with mitochondritis, or whatever it was. Oh, Progo! How did the ecthroid do that? It has to do with unnaming. The ecthroid are unnamers, non-namers. What does that have to do with Mr. Jenkins? Little Ling, I think that is what we must find out. I'd better go now and have breakfast. Then I'll meet you at Charles' school. Mr. Jenkins came across the schoolyard from the faculty parking lot. The ordinary, everyday, usual Mr. Jenkins. All right, Margaret, what is this? My dear child, if you have come again about your little brother, I can tell you it is not my policy to have one child intimidated by his peers. Meg looked warily at the principal. This sounded too good to be true. Progo, too, was uneasy. And then it was impossible there was a second Mr. Jenkins standing in front of her. That is nonsense. We cannot make an exception for any one child. Charles Wallace must learn to manage. The invisible Progonoscus shimmered, but did not materialize. This is the test, Meg. It must be. One of those Mr. Jenkinses is an Ekthros. Suddenly, beside the two Mr. Jenkinses, stood a third Mr. Jenkins. He raised one hand in greeting to the others and said, Leave the poor girl alone for a few minutes. The three men wheeled stiffly like marionettes and walked across the schoolyard into the building. We must think, Meg. Two of the three Mr. Jenkinses are at Troy, and you must name the real one. But Progo, you still haven't told me exactly what Ekthroi are. I think your mythology would call them foreign angels. War and hate are their business, and one of their chief weapons is unnaming, making people not know who they are. If someone knows who he is, really knows, then he doesn't need to hate. That's why we still need namers. A star, or a child, or a farandula. Size doesn't matter, Meg. The Ekthroi are after Charles Wallace, and the balance of the universe can be altered by the outcome. If I hate Mr. Jenkins whenever I think of him, am I naming him? You are Xing him, just like the Ekthroi. When people don't know who they are, they are open either to being exed or named. But how do I name Mr. Jenkins when all I think of when I see him is how awful he is? Progonoscus let out a small puff of smoke. Love. That's what makes persons know who they are. If you mean you think I have to love Mr. Jenkins, you've got another thing coming. May, it's the test. If you fail, I fail too. What would happen to you? I am a namer. If I care more about naming than anything else, 
then maybe I have to give myself away if it's the only way to show my love all the way away. X myself. If you do it, X yourself. Does it last forever? Nobody knows. Nobody will know till the end of time. The door to the cafeteria opened, and Mr. Jenkins came out. I assume, Margaret, that you are as confused by all this as I am. Why two strange men should wish to impersonate me, I have no idea. It sounded like the real Mr. Jenkins, but then a second one appeared. Meg, I urge you to resolve this nonsense and tell the impostors that I am Mr. Jenkins. This whole farce is wasting a great deal of time. This, too, was authentic Jenkins. A third Mr. Jenkins joined the other two. Meg, stop panicking and listen to me. There is only one of me, and I am he. Meg looked at the three men in their identical business suits. Mr. Jenkins, each of you, one at a time. What are you going to do about Charles Wallace and school? First, Mr. Jenkins three. This school has been run in far too lax and permissive a manner. From now on, if any of the first graders group together and try bullying, I shall use strong disciplinary methods. Mr. Jenkins, too? Happiness lies in success with one's peer group. I want all my children to be like each other, so we must help Charles to be more normal. Meg turned to Mr. Jenkins, one. He looked at his wristwatch. I really do not foresee much change in my relationship with Charles Wallace in the future and I resent this intrusion on my time and privacy. Get on with it, Meg. Think. What's the nicest thing you've heard about Mr. Jenkins? Think about Calvin, Meg. Calvin's shoes. Shoes. Meg saw the shoes vividly. In her mind's ear came the echo of Calvin's voice. He was so poor the year I started seventh grade that the only shoes my mother could get me at the thrift shop were at least three sizes too small. So I cut out the toes. After a few days, Mr. Jenkins called me into his office and said he'd noticed I'd outgrown my shoes. And he just happened to have an extra pair he thought would fit me. I'll never forget that he gave me the first decent pair of shoes I ever had. Meg swung around and faced the three Mr. Jenkinses. Mr. Jenkins three, you're not the real Mr. Jenkins. You're much too powerful. Mr. Jenkins, too, wanting to make everybody happy, and just like everybody else is as bad as Mr. Jenkins, three, manipulating everybody. Bad as the real Mr. Jenkins is, he's the only one of the three of you who's human enough to make as many mistakes as he does. And that's you, Mr. Jenkins, one, and I do love you for it. The air about the schoolyard was rent with a great howling and shrieking. And then a cold nothingness. Meg did not realize Blogeny was there until she heard his voice. Meg, the Exroy are enraged that you have named Mr. Jenkins. Charles Wallace's mitochondritis is now acute. He is struggling to breathe. We must go at once. Mr. Jenkins, do you wish to return to your school or will you throw in your lot with us? Uh, I believe I'm having a nervous breakdown. Uh, was there... There were uh, uh, two other, two men who resembled me? Yes. They've gone, but I must warn you, when the Ekthroi take on a human body, they tend to keep it so they may return. Sir, are you coming with us or not? Margaret named me. I will come. They were all standing on a rock. Calvin was there, too, holding out his hand to Meg. Where are we? Metron Ariston. Here all sizes become relative. Here you may be sized so that you are able to converse with a giant star or a tiny farandula. From behind a small rock, a tiny creature appeared and scampered over to them. It looked rather like a small silver blue mouse, and yet it seemed to be a sea creature rather than a land creature. Its long lavender tail had a fish-like fan at the tip. Blogeny spoke with the mouse creature. It seemed to be complaining about working with earthlings. I can see I have a great deal to teach, whoever I'm unfortunate enough to have as a partner. Perhaps when I'm as old as you are, I'll have learned a few things to teach you. 
It so happens that I was born only yesterday. There's only one of us Ferandal Eye born every generation or so nowadays. And we start our schooling the moment we're born. You're a Ferandula. Naturally. What else could I possibly be? My name is Sporus. Calvin, you and Sporus are to work together. If someone would just explain to me what is going on. The Ekthroi are trying to destroy Charles Wallace's mitochondria, Mr. Jenkins. Proganoskes is going to take you into one of Charles Wallace's mitochondria to see what is happening with its ferandoli. Proganoskes, now! Meg could see nothing but a strange, deep, green blackness. Progo, are we in Charles Wallace? Yes, Meg, in the mitochondrion called Yada. It is Boris's birthplace. Where's Calvin? Where's Mr. Jenkins? And that, that's Boris. They are all here. You will have to help Mr. Jenkins, Meg. Help him understand that grown Ferandoli do not move except by kithing. You will have to kithe to Mr. Jenkins everything I tell you. Now, kithe that you're reaching out to hold his hand. Can you feel his hand? I... I think so. Proganoskis was kithing images to Meg. She tried to send them to Mr. Jenkins. A primordial fern forest, underwater trees with silver gold green foliage swaying to submarine currents. What you are calling sea trees are grown fara. This is what Sporus will become when he deepens comes of age, grows up. If he does not deepen, it will be another victory for the Ekthroi. That is our second test, Meg. And Calvin is having trouble with Sporos. Calvin! Calvin, how are you? Meg, Sporos doesn't want to kind or be with you. He says that human beings are unworthy. Now Meg was again stretching herself toward Mr. Jenkins. Mr. Jenkins! Mr. Jenkins! The pain was beyond terror. It was the same pain that had torn across a galaxy when Proganoskis had shown her the Xing of the Ekthroi. It was the pain which had slashed across the sky in the schoolyard when she had named Mr. Jenkins. Meg was being Xed. With all of her, she kithed away from the Xness. Progo! Calvin! Help me! Meg, I name you. You are. Through her cries, Meg felt the cherubim. And then she felt Calvin. She held on to their strength as to a lifeline until the Ekthroi pain was gone. Wh what happened? Progo, wh what happened? When you reached for Mr. Jenkins' hand, Meg, you got an Ekthros, Mr. Jenkins. Now we know that at least one of them followed us here. Perhaps through Sporos. Where is it now? The Ekthros, Mr. Jenkins. Where? It doesn't matter, Meg. Every mitochondrion in Charles Wallace is in danger. If Sporos and the others of his generation do not deepen, the balance of life within Yada will be altered. Charles Wallace will die. The Ekthroi will have won. All at once, a burst of harmony surrounded Meg, Progo, Calvin, and Mr. Jenkins. It was the song of the Pharae. Those strange creatures who were deepened, rooted, yet never separated from each other, no matter how great the distance. Then Meg felt a sudden chill. There was dissonance in the harmony. The rhythm faltered. In her mind's eye, an image was flashed of a troop of Ferandoli dancing wildly about a Farah tree. Sporus is with them. Led by Sporus, the circle of Ferandoli revolved so rapidly that it became a swirling blur. There was nothing merry or joyful in the dance. It was savage, wild, furious. What are they doing? Why are they spinning so fast? They are killing the Farah. 
Yada is faltering. Like a gash through the non-light of Yada, Meg had a brief vision of Charles Wallace lying in his room, gasping for air, struggling to breathe. And again, she saw the circle of Ferrandoli whirling about another Farah. The Farah's fronds drooped, color drained. Then the voice of the Ekthros, Mr. Jenkins, could be heard. Sporus, you need not deepen and lose your power to move, to dance. No one can force you to. Do not listen to the Farah. Listen to me. Sporus, don't listen. You belong with us. You are meant to deepen. We don't want to deepen. We don't need you. Idiot. Idiot. We all need each other. <laughs> Kill the Farah. Sporus, you're my partner. Whatever we do, we must do it together. If you join the wild Ferrandoli again, I'm coming into the dance with you. Krogo, let's go too. We can help Calvin. Meg did not feel the cherubim pulling her back. She was sucked against the trunk of the Pharaoh, but the Pharaoh was now too weak to hold her up. It was she who had to give it her own life's blood. It was Meg who was dying. Then arms were around her and around Calvin. Mr. Jenkins' arms, the real Mr. Jenkins, pouring life back into her. The murderous circle was broken. Calvin held Sporus. But the moment Meg kithed away from Mr. Jenkins to Calvin, a new circle formed, not of Ferrandoli, but of Ekthros Mr. Jenkins's, swirling their deathly ring around the real Mr. Jenkins. Look at the Ekthros for us. They are killing Mr. Jenkins. Look, this is what it is like. Sporus reached out small green tendrils towards all the Ferrandoli. It is deepening time. The circle of pseudo Mr. Jenkinses was whirling wildly about the principal, closing in on him. Meg, this is the third test to rescue Mr. Jenkins. Everybody, help us. Through Meg's mind, flashed a brilliant image of Calvin wrestling with a Mr. Jenkins suddenly wild and strong. She saw Calvin reeling, sucked into the vortex of the Ekthros Mr. Jenkinses. Meg grew cold with desperation. Krogo! Krogo! Are we failing the third test? Do I have to go into the Ekthroi? Is that what I have to do? A great cry. Flame. Smoke. Feathers flying. Proganoskis flinging his great cherubic self into the void of the Ekthroi. Proganoskis Xing. Charles Wallace's familiar room. Calvin, Mr. Jenkins, the real Mr. Jenkins, and Charles Wallace sitting up in bed, breathing quite easily and normally. Charles, oh, Charles Wallace, are you all right? He's much better, Meg. We were in one of Charles Wallace's mitochondria. So he said. I am not in a doubting mood. After dinner, Meg and Calvin went out into the night, climbed the wall, and looked out on the north pasture. A tear trickled down Meg's cheek. I know, Meg. I want to know what's happened to Progo, too. Oh, Calvin, where is he? He exed of his own volition. As Progo might say, he is named, so he's all right. In silence, they returned to the house. In the pantry, they hung up their jackets. The door to the lab was closed. So was the door to the kitchen. Then the kitchen door blew open with a bang. Sandy and Dennis were at the table doing homework. Hey, you could just open the door. You don't have to take it off its hinges. We didn't touch the door. It blew open. That's nonsense. There's hardly any wind tonight. And what there is, is coming from the opposite direction. I am a namer. If I care more about naming than anything else, then maybe I have to give myself away. If it's the only way to show my love. Calvin's eyes met Meg's for a long moment and held her gaze, not speaking, not kiving, simply being. <laughs>